So let's get started. So last week we talked about terpenoids. Uh, we also discussed other things like the carbohydrates, uh, essential oils, resins, things like that. This week we're going to be talking about phenolics and compounds that are related to the, comp uh, to the phenolic compounds, mainly because they sort of start with the same precursors. Um, when it comes to phenolic compounds, they're classified based on their structure. And so there is overlap with some of the other sections. For example, some, as I mentioned last week, some of the terpenoids can be considered to be phenolic compounds. Even though they're not made by this pathway, they still have a phenolic ring on it. But most of the phenolic compounds that we're going to talk about today are made by the same pathways. Now, I realize your handouts, this is a little bit fuzzy because this is a screenshot and when I uh, save the, uh, the, the PowerPoint as a PDF, I have to reduce the size so that it's not 40 megabytes. And so this goes a little blurry. I'll send, see if I can send you a PDF file, some of these images, just so you can see sort of how they're all connected. But basically when we're talking about phenolics, there's a whole bunch of different categories that sort of fall under this umbrella term. And there's gonna be some simple phenolics, uh, some of the things like salicylic acid, some of the tannins that we've already uh, discussed briefly. Uh, and then it'll be most of them will be the phenylpropanoid derivatives. And these are basically um, sort of the building blocks for all the phenolic compounds like uh, bioflavonoids, um, the anthocyanidins, uh, lignans, all these different things are all kind of built from this. So we'll go through these in a little bit more detail after. So to start off with, the most simple phenolic compound is basic phenol and hydroquinone. And so if you look at the top, phenol, or this is the basic phenol compound. You have an aromatic ring, so that's a six-membered ring with a benzene, it's a benzene group with an OH group attached to it. That's phenol. And then you have some variations on this, catechol, which basically has two OH groups on the aromatic ring. And this catechol group, you may have heard of things like catechol amines. These are uh, things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine all fall into the category of being catechol amines. They're derivatives of tyrosine. And um, their structure uh, has this basic OH group on their, on their ring structure there. Um, Another one is hydroquinone, and this is sort of a basic uh, structure where you have the OH groups opposite each other on the ring structure. And certain compounds um, that possess this are used in our bodies, like CoQ10 has a basic sort of hydroquinone-like uh, structure to it, although it's called an aptoquinone. Um, and what makes phenolic compounds significant is their ability to accept and give up an electron. And so that OH group allows for a single electron to be transferred to it, and then it can stabilize that electron on the ring structure. The double, bond, the double bonds will move around and sort of stabilize it. And so although it's shown those double bonds on the ring are as being static, they're actually constantly moving. It's more like a, like a cloud of electrons that move around that way. And so phenolic compounds have the ability to sort of grab the free radical or a single electron and sort of shift it around. That's why it remains stable. Um, so in general, phenolic compounds uh, are antioxidants. And what that means is they have the ability to sequester or scavenge free radicals. And something that's worth mentioning is that pretty much all antioxidants also have the potential to act as a pro-oxidant. So although they can accept a free electron, a lot of these antioxidants can also steal and create sorry. Can you guys still see my screen? We had a slow connection so I had to turn off my camera. Yes, okay. So one of the things with the phenolic compounds and the antioxidants, they can act as both an antioxidant and a pro-oxidant. 
And so usually these things have a protective effect in the body, but sometimes in really high amounts, it can kind of reverse their function. They can actually have a damaging effect. And so excess supplementation of, um, of phenolic compounds could have a negative effect. So as I mentioned, they have an antioxidant effect. A lot of these phenolic compounds have potential anti-inflammatory effects. They'll interact with certain receptors and enzymes in the body to decrease inflammation. Now, because they scavenge free radicals, many of them can help prevent cancer, but also various phenolic compounds have the ability to uh, interact with certain receptors on cells to induce apoptosis or to help decrease inflammation and do all these various things that can help reduce cancer growth. So a lot of phenolic compounds uh, have that ability. And then finally, one of the main reasons why plants make probably these phenolic compounds is that they have some antimicrobial effects. And so they're probably formed by the plants as a defense mechanism. And so this is in general what phenols do. Uh, we'll talk about the specific roles of each one when we get into it in a second. So these are the basic phenols, but you know, I would say phenol by itself isn't something that you take as a supplement. It's usually when it's attached to other ring structures, it has a more protective effect. So phenolic compounds, which are often just called antioxidants, are great for preventing degenerative disease. They're beneficial for preventing and treating cancer. They have a beneficial effect on heart disease because they can um, sequester free radicals and decrease inflammation that are part of the process of generating plaques with atherosclerosis or, or coronary heart disease. Um, because of the anti-inflammatory effects, they're often used for arthritis and then finally with various types of infections. And so phenolic compounds are ubiquitous, meaning they're found in pretty much any plant will have these phenolic compounds. And um, I would say that um, for me, the most interesting things about nutrition are not the macronutrients, the protein, the fats, and the carbohydrates, not the micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals, but rather what are called the non-essential nutrients. And these are the compounds that a lot of these are phenolic-based compounds. Uh, some of them are also uh, various terpenoids. Some of them could also be um, other types of fibers and stuff like that. But the phenolic compounds are really significant. So a lot of the plants that we hear about that have that are uh, the superfoods, the, the various spices and stuff, they're loaded with various types of phenolic compounds. So things like ginger, turmeric, blueberries, um, cinnamon, like those are just a few that have these phenolic compounds in it. Now, when we start off with the most simple forms, I'm sure phenol exists in plants, but we don't really discuss it very much from a phytochemical standpoint. Um, Hydroquinone, it does exist in plants. And one of the things that hydroquinone does is, as I mentioned, it accepts and donates electrons. So it undergoes oxidation and reduction reactions to sort of go very easily between hydroquinone and benzoquinone. Um, now, in nature, as far as I know, hydroquinone usually doesn't exist in its free form. And the reason for that is a relatively small molecule it acts as an essential oil. It can have some disruptive effects because it can both accept and donate electrons. Um, and hydroquinone in this form will actually act as a bleaching agent. And so you don't really want to have this in high amounts floating around the system because it has more of a destructive effect than it does by helping prevent heart disease and cancer because it's just a little bit too reactive. And when you have um, antioxidants, Antioxidants in general are reactive compounds, but you want them to be relatively stable. Otherwise, they'll cause more harm than good. So hydroquinone, it's not really used as an antioxidant by the body. In herbal medicine, we use it more as a pro-oxidant, something that can basically disrupt cell membranes and have an antimicrobial effect. And the way that we base or the way that uh, hydroquinone becomes more stable uh, and a little bit safer to use is when it's in the form of a glycoside. And so arbutin is a glycoside of hydroquinone. And our hydro, um, arbutin 
is found primarily in bearberry. So bearberry is a classic herb used for urinary tract infections. And it's also called Arctostaphylus uva ursi. And so this plant, we use it commonly for women who are having uh, urinary tract infections. Typically, uh, when the urine is more alkaline in nature, so when it's less acidic. And one of the reasons why um, this is such an effective thing or a useful thing for urinary tract infections is when we consume the bearberry, we're basically consuming arbutin in the form of a glycoside. So there's a sugar molecule attached to it. Now, what ends up happening? Pardon me. What ends up happening is in order to make the the arbutin active so it can kill the, the bugs, it needs to have the sugar released because the sugar basically stabilizes the arbutin and prevents it from sort of acting as a free radical and, and accepting and donating electrons significantly. Once you cleave that sugar, those two OH groups are able to accept and donate electrons quite effectively. And so you require either hydrolysis, which is acid and heat or a really alkaline environment uh, to cleave off that sugar or you want to have an enzyme called beta-glucoxidase, we'll cleave it off. Now, you will naturally get some hydrolysis occurring in the stomach. And so when that happens, uh, you could have um, free hydroquinone. If you're drinking, let's say, bearberry tea, you will get a certain amount of hydroquinone just released in the stomach. And as a result, that could have a destructive effect and generate some free radicals. In animal studies, um, they found giving bearberry long-term and high amounts could slightly increase the risk of getting stomach cancer. And that makes sense because if you generate free radicals, that can have a negative effect and cause some damage and, and um, increase the risk for, for cancers and mutations in the stomach. So the reason why I mention that is I wouldn't typically use bearberry tea preventatively to prevent uh, or to, to reduce the risk of getting urinary tract infections. I would use it only acutely for a couple weeks or maybe a month or so to treat urinary tract infections uh, because of that. So that's just a little side note. Now, when it comes to arbutin, um, some of it will, won't be broken down uh, or the stuff that is broken down, the liver will attach a sugar to it, again, probably, and reactivate it. So eventually this arbutin ends up traveling into the urinary tract and gets excreted there. And so what happens in the urinary tract, it's a relatively uh, neutral environment. Uh, so hydrolysis won't occur unless there's certain enzymes present. And certain bacteria, including E. coli, which is the most common cause of urinary tract infections, these bacteria have the beta-glucoxidase enzyme. And so when they see the arbutin, the arbutin to them looks like a fuel source because they see the sugar on it and they want to liberate that sugar and consume it. So they'll basically uh, digest the sugar. And as a result, this hydroquinone molecule becomes liberated. And because it's such a small molecule, it'll sort of find its way in between the cell membranes and have a disruptive effect and put little holes in the cell membrane, making uh, kind of weakening or harming the bacteria. And as a result, it will inhibit the growth of these bacteria in the urinary tract. And so it's kind of interesting because our butin has, it's a very, it's like a delivery system for the hydroquinone. So it helps prevent, I mean, if you just took hydroquinone alone, chances are it would just react and be um, uh, sort of broken down or, or just react in the stomach and significant amounts probably wouldn't actually get to the urinary tract. So by having a sugar attached to it, it helps to carry that, uh, that toxic substance to the, uh, to the bacteria and decrease the side effects. So to me, our mutant is kind of like a mousetrap where you've got the cheese is the sugar molecule and the hydroquinone is, is the active uh, set trap. Um, so in addition, the hydroquinone or the arbutin, um, it probably has some astringent effects, but it's primarily action is going to be uh, an antimicrobial, a uh, urinary uh, antiseptic. Now we're going to move on to things that are called phenolic acids. 
And the phenolic acids, there's a number of them we'll talk about. What phenolic acids refer to is basically salicyl salicylic acid and related compounds like gallic acid. Um, now, phenolic acids, the reason why they're called that is because there's a phenol group and then there's a carboxylic acid attached to it. And so if you look at salicylic acid, which is um, the kind of the precursor for aspirin, so if you remember aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid, um, you've got the carboxylic acid group, which is this compound right here, the uh, double bond to the O and the OH group here. This is your carboxylic acid, and this is your phenol group here. And so that's the simplest basic phenolic acid. And then depending on where you add, if you add more OH groups onto this ring structure, you'll have different types of them, including gallic acid and some of the other hydrolyzable tannins. Now, benzoic acid, this is commonly found in as a preservative in things like orange juice. So if you remember as a kid, um, I used to get, we used to get those orange juice that had the uh, aluminum foil on the top that you peel back. And it always had kind of this strange little tangy me metallic taste to the orange juice. And that was the preservative in it. Um, presumably it was a benzoic acid. It had this sort of um, unusual taste to it. But although technically speaking, benzoic acid isn't a true phenolic acid because it's not a phenol group. There's no OH group on the ring. Sometimes it's thrown under the same umbrella as phenolic acids. And you'll notice that with a lot of phytochemistry stuff, sometimes the classification isn't 100% accurate, um, but benzoic acid is sort of under that category. Now, benzoic acid, it is found in a number of different fruits and vegetables, um, just like salicylic acid is. And so if you're eating a diet that's rich in plant material, you're going to have lots of these simple phenolic acids in your diet. And if you, as you know, salicylic acid has some anti-inflammatory effects. And so a plant-based diet, probably due to these phytochemicals, will have a natural anti-inflammatory effect. Now, as you know, a high amounts of salicylic acid will increase the risk of having a stomach uh, ulcer and things like that. But the amount in, in a diet of fruits and vegetables is relatively small. So it just has a, sl just a slight anti-inflammatory effect. And then other phytochemicals will have some anti-inflammatory effects from the diet as well. Now, we talked about gallic acid. Gallic acid, we're going to talk about this more during the hydrolyzable tannins. Um, gallic acid, I didn't include a picture of it there. I don't know why. I used to have one there. We'll talk about it in a second. Elagic acid is a type of phenolic acid that's actually a dimer or basically two gallic acid molecules that are stuck together. And so what the gallic acid molecules, I'm just gonna zoom in here for a second. So I'm just gonna go into here and there we go. So what I've just cut off here, I've severed it in half, more or less, and you can see here, here is the benzene ring here. These are the phenol groups here, and this is another phenol group here. And here's your carboxylic acid group, and it's attached to the other phenol group. So when you divide this in half, you basically have two gallic acid molecules. Gallic acid is one of the precursors for stringent compounds, including tannic acid and some other things. And so the significance of elagic acid is that you find this in this form or attached to sugars uh, to make various glycosides and you're going to find it in various fruits and vegetables including things like pomegranate and raspberries and this compound has lots of antioxidant effects there's an astringent effect to it um, and it's also believed it has some anti-cancer effects i'm certain that it has some beneficial effects on lowering blood pressure potentially or decreasing inflammation um, definitely what we know about pomegranate juice is that it does have lots of beneficial effects uh, for reducing heart disease and elagic acid is one of a number of different compounds in it 
the red color in pomegranate juice is more likely related to the proanthocyan or the anthocyanidins, same color that you get in blueberries and raspberries and stuff like that. But ellagic acid is just one of many compounds that has that's a non-essential nutrient that has health promoting effects. <clears throat> now the next group of compounds we're going to talk about are the phenylpropanoids. Now you probably remember uh, from biochemistry class phenylalanine and tyrosine. So phenylalanine um, is basically the precursor for tyrosine. Tyrosine is the same structure with an OH group on the benzene ring there. And these two amino acids can be used as building blocks for all the other various phenol compounds we're going to talk about. And so um, the various phenol compounds we're going to talk about have the nitrogen removed. And once it's removed, you can form, add things and remove things to get these complex polyphenols that we'll discuss later on. And so we'll talk about it. The simplest things like the hydroxycinamic acids, we'll talk about them, and then other categories like coumarins, certain essential oils, polyphenols, things like stilbenoids that are found in red wine, lignans that are found in things like flaxseed, and then all the various flavonoids that are found in oranges and soy and uh, blueberries and chocolate and tea and everything else. And so these are a really large group of um, compounds. So again, phenylalanine and tyrosine are your basic building blocks and they kind of are used to make all these other compounds there. So this little structure here, these are not called phenolic acids per se because the carboxylic acid group or the acid isn't attached directly to the benzene ring. Rather these phenylpropanoids, the reason why it's called a phenylpropanoid is phenol refers to the aromatic ring and then propane if you remember from chemistry is three carbons so uh, propane gas is just three carbons uh, it's a hydrocarbon with three carbons propanols and alcohol so phenylpropanoids are basically are um, going to be it's going to have a, a chain on the side with three carbons attached to it and these end up being uh, building blocks for other aromatic compounds. Now, some of the basic ones that we'll talk about are the cinnamic acids, and these are used as building blocks for various things. Some people will just call them cumeric acid or caffeic acid or ferulic acid. And I would say that all plants, or almost, I don't want to say all plants, but lots of plants have these basic cinnamic acids, these things like caffeic acid or ferulic acid in them. Spices will have them, uh, coffee has them, and these are the building blocks. And although they're not as good at antioxidants as some of the other things that we're talking about, because there's so many of them in our diet, they probably have a pretty significant role in helping protect our body against inflammation and oxidative stress. Now, so that's just a little, basically a little back, um, oh, uh, just as an aside, at the top, the cinnamaldehyde is an essential oil that you'll find in cinnamon oil. Cinnamic acid is also found in cinnamon, uh, just a few things. You don't need to have to know a lot about these guys, but it's more the next stage. Next slide is what we'll talk about more in detail. So phenylpropenes, the phenylpropenes, these are the derivatives of the phenylpropanoids. These don't have the carboxylic acid group attached to it. You've got a benzene ring and you've got three carbons coming off of it. Um, because that carboxylic acid group has come off, these are going to be a lot more volatile because one of the things that makes uh, a compound water soluble and less likely to evaporate is one, if it's small and two, if it has less oxygens on it. So when there's a car carboxylic acid group, it's going to have some, uh, hydrogen bonding forming with the water, so it's not going to want to evaporate as much, plus those extra oxygens make it heavier. So a lot of the phenylpropenes are going to be much more volatile um, because they don't have a lot of oxygens on there and uh, they don't have that carboxylic acid group. 
And so the phenylpropenes, the reason why they call propene is because there's a double bond on the side chain, the three carbon side chain. So the phenylpropenes refers to a lot of the essential oils that you're going to find um, in, in various aromatic plants. And so the phenylpropenes and monoterpenes are the two most common types of essential oils. The difference is the pathways that they're made. So phenylpropenes, if you count up the carbons attached to the ring structure, you'll see the anethol, which is shown at the bottom there. That's the main uh, ingredient that you'll get in uh, anise and fennel. And it has that sort of black licorice taste to it. And that anethol compound, if you count it, although it has 10 carbons, don't be fooled because that one CH group attached to the auction, it was added on later on. But this is a phenylpropene, and it's different. It's a different pathway than the terpenoids are. So the phenylpropenes are found in lots of the spices you have in your in your uh, spice cabinet, in your kitchen. Uh, usually, the ones that are in the APAC family, which includes things like fennel and anise. Um, uh, what else is in there? Cumin, um, tarragon. Um, those spices tend to have a lot of the anthol, but also some of the members of the mint family will also have them, like basil and holy basil and things like that. Um, so in general, lots of essential oils, they have smell, they have a uh, specific taste to them. Um, they usually have some antimicrobial effects to them. Um, and in general, the phenylpropenes will have a carminative effect. And we'll talk about that more later on, but they basically increase circulation. They can cause vasodilation and increase circulation to, to certain parts of the body. Now, one thing to be aware of is that these phenylpropenes, some of them have the potential to be toxic to the liver. And the hepatotoxic compounds usually have the double bond at the terminal end. And so one thing I've observed is if you look at, for example, saffron, this is what uh, was one of the active ingredients in the original root beer. And so when root beer was made since sassafras in the past, people started getting liver problems and, and liver cancer, and it was associated with this saffron compound. And so consuming high amounts of this essential oils can cause liver damage and, and uh, long-term consumption cause liver cancer. And if you look at it, the double bond, uh, so this phenylpropene has a terminal double bond right here. And in my opinion, and I could be wrong, this seems to have the potential to become um, more carcinogenic and harder on the liver. And I suspect that during phase one detox, this thing becomes activated um, and then uh, probably depletes the body of things like cysteine and glutathione. And so clove oil s contains uginol, uh, myristicin is found in nutmeg. All three of these, I think the essential oils have the potential to be a lot harder on the liver than other essential oils. Um, now, we know that things like basil and clove and nutmeg and holy basil, some of these plants that contain these potentially carcinogenic compounds also have anti-cancer effects. So it may be all dose dependent. So if there's relatively small amounts in the plant and there's other phytochemicals that may have a protective effect. But if you were to isolate, I think, uginol or clove oil, we know that if you took that in high amounts, that it does have, it can cause drug-induced hepatitis, as well as the saffron. Um, so cinnamon oil, the aromatic cinnamon smell is going to be related to this compound. It's often used as a marker for, um, for cinnamon and some, some, uh, some products. Let's check my questions here, see if there's anything. So the next group of compounds are what are called the hydroxycinamic acids. And probably the two most common ones are caffeic acid and cumeric acid. Another one is called ferulic acid. These are found in lots of different plants. Uh, because of the OH group here, this is a phenol compound. Because of this carboxylic acid here, this is what makes it a... Um, um, 
a, a, a phenylpropanoid because you've got the um, or the cinnamic acid refers to this, and you've got the three-member thing what makes it, makes it derived from the propanoids. And so a number of these compounds in this state or slightly modified um, make some really good substances to have in your diet. Like most of the antioxidants, or most of the uh, phenolic compounds, they'll, they'll have antioxidant effects, they'll have anti-inflammatory effects, they'll have anti-cancer effects. Now, caffeic acid, which is going to be found in a slightly different form in high amounts of coffee, uh, also has some other properties to it. And one thing about coffee is it contains this compound called chlorogenic acid. And what you have is basically a caffeic acid molecule attached to a quinic acid. Now, quinic acid, it's, I think it's basically a, uh, it in itself, I don't think has a lot of medicinal effects. It does have some astringent actions. Um, it's going to be a little bit like things like gallic acid and stuff like that. It's properties, I suspect, a little weaker. But the caffeic acid combined with the quinic acid is one of the substances that gives coffee a lot of its health benefits. So chlorogenic acid is what it's called. And when you look at coffee, most people are like, certainly I've heard naturopaths in the past say, it's not good to take coffee. You know, coffee is bad for you. It's hard on the adrenals, um, a number of other things. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm trying to reduce my coffee consumption. And I would say, coffee is good for you. Excessive amounts of caffeine is not so good for you, but in general, Coffee is probably, uh, around the world, the top dietary antioxidant. I would say it's, it has more health-promoting benefits than any, anything else. Although there are probably more potent antioxidants out there, the fact of the matter is most people don't eat tons of blueberries every single day. They don't, um, you know, they don't consume. Uh, it's even more like the research shows it's better than red wine. It's better than green tea, like from an antioxidant standpoint. It has a lot of health benefits, and uh, I'm in the process of just writing a little research blog on it. But some of the health benefits of coffee um, includes it reduces the risk of diabetes. And so the chlorogenic acid or some of these other compounds appear to help lower blood sugar and, and uh, decrease insulin resistance. And so by someone consuming more coffee, you're actually going to have a positive effect on reducing the risk of developing diabetes. Obviously, if you're having a triple triple with lots of cream and three sugars, that's going to work against you. But if you're drinking your coffee black, that's great. So, um, drinking black coffee is going to be beneficial for that. Other things is that it's shown to have a really positive effect on heart disease and cardiovascular disease. Um, so, one of the things that they found is that not only does it lower the risk of a heart attack. But if you have a heart attack and you're a high coffee consumer, it actually reduces the risk of dying from that heart attack, which is really positive. Uh, in addition to that, it can lower the risk of getting what's called a venoembolism. And so basically getting a blood clot uh, in your veins that can then go to your brain or go to your lungs and, and cause problems. So um, if you get a blood clot in the brain, it'll cause stroke. And so coffee has been shown to reduce the risk of developing strokes. Another thing that it does is it lowers the risk of getting gout. And so gout is a disorder uh, where purines aren't being excreted properly and they accumulate. You get uric acid accumulating in the joints and it can be very painful causing uh, typically um, really bad inflammation in the toes and the feet, but it can occur in other spots. And some people seem to be susceptible to it, but also eating a high meat diet, lots of alcohol, lots of sugar can also have uh, increase your risk for gout. But drinking lots of black coffee has been shown to reduce the risk of gout by about 10 to 24 percent, which is not huge, but every little bit helps sometimes with these conditions. The other thing that coffee does is it helps, first of all, it stimulates liver, the liver to uh, release more bile, so it can help just with digestive function in general, but partly because it can affect uh, blood sugar it can reduce the risk of developing a fatty liver. Now, just as an aside, fatty liver, uh, people get this not because they're consuming too much fat, but usually because they're consuming too much like high fructose corn syrup and, and lots of sugar that stimulates 
cholesterol synthesis and fat synthesis. Um, so coffee can reduce the risk of fatty liver, but it can also help prevent scarring of the liver as well through its antioxidant effects. So a lot of people that have damage to the liver, there's a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation going on, and it can help to blunt that effect. Studies are showing that it helps prevent Alzheimer's disease, and Alzheimer's disease, um, I think, is multifactorial. I think that um, you know it's related to oxidative stress. It's related to inflammation. I think it's related to high blood sugar. I think it's related to all the things. Basically, when you have inflammation, oxidative stress, and lots of sugar in the body, it increases your risk of all those diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, and Alzheimer's. And so that's another thing. And then finally, um, coffee has a really significant effect on reducing the risk of a whole bunch of different cancers. A lot of these are in the digestive tract, like gastric cancer, so stomach cancer and esophageal cancer. Some of these are related to the endometrium, um, so some female cancers, also liver, gallbladder, prostate even skin, so somehow those little coffee compounds end up uh, helping prevent skin and also pancreatic cancer. So lots of really great things that coffee does. Uh, a lot of the research is showing drinking somewhere between three and five cups for some of these studies is where people get maximum benefit. Um, and I like to emphasize that coffee has the chlorogenic acid. It also has other compounds related to that, like for example, um, the uh, chlorogenic acid is called caffeoquinic acid, uh, and it's kind of at the three position on the on the quinic acid. And then you have other ones with the four and the five position. So they're just different versions of the of basically the chlorogenic acid. Um, but in addition, we all know that coffee has caffeine in it, and so although caffeine is found in other things like tea. Uh, a lot of the health benefits of coffee is not related to caffeine itself. I mean, caffeine has some antidepressant effects. It has a stimulant effect. It usually is a thing that um, too much coffee is, is usually makes people jittery, and that's going to be related more to the caffeine. So if you want to drink lots of coffee and you don't want to get feeling you're all stressed out and jittery and, and, uh, and anxious and then sort of crash later on in the day, a couple of little hints would be, one to drink it with uh, a full stomach. So you don't want to have like drink coffee on an empty stomach because then it sort of hits your system harder and then more likely to um, make you feel uh, overstimulated. Um, you get more of a delayed effect. It's not unlike drinking alcohol on a full stomach versus an empty stomach. So that might be one way. The other thing you could do is make sure that you drink coffee uh, when you're making it make half decaf and half normal coffee. So if you're planning on having more than a couple cups a day, um, maybe kind of 50-50 decaf normal coffee because decaf coffee will still have the health benefits that regular coffee has, caffeinated coffee. Um, so that's another little strategy. And then uh, finally, maybe that's it. So coffee is great. It's got more antioxidants than uh, wine does, than tea does, uh, and it's probably the most important dietary antioxidant because around the world, a lot of people don't eat enough fruits and vegetables, but they do drink coffee, coffee in high enough. So it's positive. Don't worry about if your patient's drinking coffee, uh, but definitely if they're feeling anxious, uh, overstimulated, then maybe get them switched to decaf. I got a couple questions here. Uh, Maddie was asking, are the health benefits of coffee still present decaffeinated? Yes, they are. Uh, someone else asking me, what do you think about coffee enemas? Um, coffee enemas, so basically what a lot of old detox things that people would do is they would basically uh, boil up some coffee and then basically inject it in the rectum. And... The reason for this is that it stimulated bowel movement, helped em empty out the colon, um, and I guess the, the idea is you're just trying to cleanse the body. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I don't think it's a good idea. I've, I've never done it personally for no particular reason. I just have never felt toxic enough that I needed to. Um, I think that for some people it could be beneficial. Um, you are less likely to absorb the caffeine that way. 
uh, because of the antioxidants in it, it's going to have some local effects that could be positive. Uh, I think you'd want to be careful with people with colitis. It could be aggravating for them. Um, so I don't know if there's any research showing benefit for coffee enemas, but I suspect that there probably is some benefits for doing that. Um, sometimes by doing things like that, you could be stimulating some of the detox pathways in the system. So don't really have a lot I can comment on it. Um, I can't see a lot of harm in doing it, except for the fact that if someone had Crohn's disease or a serious inflammatory um, bowel disease, it could be could be aggravating for them. Um, does the, someone's asked about the decaffeinated process, does it affect some of these compounds? It definitely affects the caffeine. Um, it shouldn't have a major effect on a lot of these antioxidants to the best of my knowledge. Uh, another question, <clears throat> Brittany is saying that some males with prostate issues find that coffee makes it worse for them. Um, I'm not sure if that's just because it's a diuretic. Drinking lots of coffee can stimulate urine uh, flow, and if you have already have a prostate issue, your ability to, um, you're, basically you're, you're finding that you're having to go pee already, and so drinking more coffee may, may make you feel like you have to go pee even more often, and the prostate is restricting the urine flow, so that's an issue. Um, there could be some irritating effect to the, to the prostate that I don't know about. So it does reduce the risk of prostate cancer, but it, I guess it could irritate it just from a diuretic standpoint. I don't know enough about that to say any more than that, though. Uh, Caitlin asked, in terms of esophageal cancer, if coffee gives you bad acid reflux, would that increase the risk of esophageal cancer? Uh, I would say having reflux, like acid reflux, what basically happens is the stomach acid uh, bubbles in the esophagus, irritates the esophagus because it's not really designed to handle high amounts of acid. And the acid will generate free radicals that can, in, that can cause basically mutations to the cells and increase the risk of cancer. So here we have a situation where if someone who's drinking coffee but causes reflux, is it going to be more good or more bad for them? I would say probably best if you're getting reflux from the coffee to deal with the reflux um, and maybe back off on the coffee. See whether or not decaf makes a difference or not. Um, I don't know if the um, health benefits from the antioxidants of the coffee will outweigh the negative effects uh, of the reflux. So I can't really comment. In general, when they do these large studies, they're just finding there's trends in people who drink coffee get less esophageal cancer. But the disadvantage of research is you're taking thousands of individuals and trying to make you know general trends. But when you look at it, you know there's there's um, when you look at these studies, there's like little, here's the control group and here is the other group. And there's usually often overlap between the two to some degree. And so you do have to do it by individual basis when you're making decisions. So if someone gets heartburn and you're trying to prevent uh, esophageal cancer, but they get heartburn for drinking coffee, then maybe tell them to not drink that. And there's other things they could do that would have a beneficial effect. So um, that's probably not a clear answer for that one, Caitlin. Or at least I don't know if there is. Um, so, the next thing we'll talk about are polyphenols. So, when you look at the, these various compounds that we talked about so far, the ferulic acid, caffeic acid, and some of the different sort of derivatives uh, from that, um, those are all, if you go back, these all have a single, basically, uh, phenol group on it. Even the chlorogenic acid, that compound on the right, it looks like a phenol group, but it's not because that six-membered ring over here, this is not a phenol group because it's not an aromatic ring here. So technically speaking, this is not a polyphenol. Um, polyphenols have multiple phenol groups to it. And we'll, these are some of the more important 
antioxidants. I think these are more specialized. These are probably more potent if you were to compare them head to head against caffeic acid and ferulic acid. These guys are much stronger and they have a lot, probably they're, they're better in a lot of ways, but because the other ones are more abundant in the, uh, in our diets, uh, for the average person, maybe they're going to have more significant effects on a day to day basis. But, uh, you can increase your, your, your antioxidants and anti-inflammatory compounds by trying to specifically choose these polyphenols. Um, so a couple of polyphenols, just to give you some examples, the polyphenol just basically means there's two OH groups. And so some of these guys are really important. And all that they are is just basically dimers where you basically have fused two of the uh, things like caffeic acid together. And so there's one in particular called rosmarinic acid. I like this compound. Uh, rosmarinic acid. How's my sound here? It's just connecting to the audio. Did I lose sound here? Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me again? Are we good here? Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. I just reset my, my Wi-Fi and it seems to be fine now. I believe you just sort of, I lost a connection. You've. Am I correct that you guys could not see or hear me for a couple seconds? Or since I started with the polyphenols, is that right? Okay. So with the polyphenols, we'll talk about some of these. There's a whole category that we'll talk about in a second, but then there's some specific ones that are just kind of interesting. Interesting. Um, Rosemarinic acid, this compound is found in high amounts in rosemary, but it's also found in a number of other spices, including rosemary, peppermint, oregano, sage, thyme, lemon balm. So those are all members of the mint family. Um, I've seen this compound and also in a few of the herbs used in Chinese medicine to treat allergies. And when you look at some of the studies done on rosemarinic acid in particular, it seems to have an anti-allergic effect. Um, so. I've used it in combinations of for herbal formulas to help with seasonal allergies. You could do it as a tea or you could take it as a tincture. And so this compound here, what it basically is structurally is a f two of these hydroxycinamic acids fused together. So basically caffeic acid esters. And so it's a polyphenol because you've got phenol group here and a phenol group there. Um, so lots of good benefits. Rosemary in itself, just as an aside, contains this compound. It also contains some essential oils. It's also going to contain, uh, I know that it has some triterpenoids in there as well and other compounds. I love rosemary and probably including more rosemary in your diet or even just growing some at home and just eating the occasional little leaves off of it um, would be a good thing to do. Um, I think actually probably eating any plant material is going to be a good thing. To, most certainly not any. 
There's lots of plants that will kill you. Most of the spices at home are probably going to have a lot of health benefits to them. Um, now, another important polyphenol. Um, this is a unique group of compounds. These are called curcuminoids. And shown on the right there, that's a picture of, uh, of turmeric root. And turmeric is in the same family as ginger. Ginger also contains uh, galanga, which is Thai ginger, cardamom. And so they have rhizomes. These are a uh, specific kind of root that when you break them in half, you can plant the, both halves and a tree will kind of run on the tree, but a, uh, the plant will grow from it. And so the turmeric, what makes it unique, I think everyone knows, it has this beautiful bright yellow color that's used. It's been used in curries for hundreds and hundreds of years. It's been used also as a dye. Um, this curcumin molecule is probably one of the most researched phytochemicals that I can think of. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies in uh, PubMed for this compound. And so turmeric contains lots of different phytochemicals. Uh, the root itself will contain essential oils. Uh, it contains curcuminoids. And it also contains... Um, certain carbohydrates, and all those compounds will have, are biologically active to some degree. Now, most of the research with turmeric has focused on a single compound called curcumin. Curcumin is the most abundant of the curcuminoids, and it's the most researched one. So um, one of the things that you'll see a lot of products on the market will contain, let's say, 95% curcumin extracts. And that's the main active ingredient. And a lot of the companies out there will also have modified curcumin in such a way uh, in, the, in the form that it's in to try to increase absorption of it. Because one of the challenges with polyphenols in general is they're not that well absorbed. And uh, so curcumin, it's a really great compound. Structurally, if you look at it, you can see that it looks more or less like it was probably built from uh, a couple of molecules of ferulic acid and caffeic acid. Um, and when you compare the potency of curcumin contained to those caffeic acid and ferulic acid, the building blocks for this compound, um, it's not as powerful. So curcumin in this form, it's just a more potent thing and it has different effects on the body or stronger effects than uh, the other compounds. Uh, I love curcumin. I think it's a great compound. I'd use it for patients with pretty much is one of the most common antioxidants I would recommend to people. The question is, is it better to use curcumin in a standardized extract, 95% that's uh, you know specifically designed to increase absorption, or is it better to have it in your diet? This is sort of a debate or a discussion that we don't have an answer for this right now. One thing I can say that's interesting is that when you look at turmeric as a whole herb, in addition to curcumin, there are going to be other curcuminoids that could have some biological activities that we haven't fully ex explored and understand yet. The essential oil component may have some benefits. And even the carbohydrate component of turmeric has some health benefits. And what's really interesting, just as an aside, is we know we've already discussed how beta-glucans can have um, a stimulatory effect on the immune system. And what's neat is we found that when you look at uh, curcumin extracts that are void of the curcuminoids that are mostly the carbohydrate components of it. Um, the carbohydrate components of turmeric also have anti-inflammatory effects. And so what's interesting is you have the curcuminoids, specifically curcumin, and also the carbohydrate component that have anti-inflammatory effects. And so the question is, could there be a synergistic, synergistic effect when these carbohydrates and the curcuminoids are taken simultaneously. Because the, large, the big argument is that a lot of people are like, well, curcumin's not that well absorbed. Uh, so taking it, you know, from turmeric powder, it's not going to be clinically significant. But then we know that people that are consuming turmeric in their diet in the form of curries and stuff like that, it lowers the risk of cancer and other things and heart disease and everything else. And so if you're not absorbing it, then how is it having its therapeutic effect? And so it may be having the effects in the gut, or there could be other phytochemicals in the tumor that are kind of working to help curcumin do its job. So that being said, 
sometimes I will recommend a potent curcumin extract for someone. Maybe we'll try that for arthritis or we'll try it for people with cancer. I think for health promotion, having turmeric on a daily basis or on a weekly basis in your diet is probably a great approach to have. I don't think you have to take it. Sometimes I'll get people to, let's say if they're doing specific things for heart disease or, or lowering cholesterol or trying to decrease inflammation, I don't want to sell them 20 bottles of pills to take on a daily basis. So sometimes I'll work with their diet. And one strategy that I've done, sometimes we'll get people to do is to, is to take tomato juice, for example, and just add a quarter teaspoon of turmeric into it. And I might recommend that for someone who's trying to lower the risk for heart disease or trying to uh, treat arthritis or maybe trying to lower inflammation if they have colitis, like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And so that approach uh, can be beneficial. Um, and then I might supplement on top of that. So that's turmeric. Like I said, curcumin, it's an awesome compound. I think it's fantastic. My only concern is that sometimes people might be um, focusing exclusively on the curcumin and neglecting some of the other important compounds in tumor. Um, and just as a side, we know one thing I find really fascinating about in India, if you've ever been there, it's probably, it's the most polluted place I've ever been in. It's, it's very, very polluted. There's lots of garbage. There's lots of the, a lot of the drinking water is poor. Uh, there's chemicals around, it's, it's lots of air pollution, cars and everything else. Yet what's interesting is that India has one of, the, one of the lowest risks of cancer in the world. And which shocked me because I just assumed with all the pollution around, it would be really, really, uh, cancer would be quite high. But because if you look at a diet, an Indian based diet, uh, one, there's a lot of uh, vegetarian dishes that people consume and two, a lot of the food that people eat, a lot of the curries and a lot of the teas and everything else, it's loaded with spices and herbs that are rich in phytochemicals that have antioxidants and uh, and uh, anti-inflammatory compounds. And we know how important those things are. So in Indian diet, um, even though they have a lot of pollution, likely their plant-based diet and all these spices are going to be really, really uh, rich in compounds that help to fight cancer. So that's just kind of a neat thing. So turmeric's great. At the very least, try to have a little bit in your diet. Uh, I don't think there's any need for the average person to supplement with curcumin if they don't have an issue. I think just try to get it in your diet. But with someone who has certain serious conditions like cancer, I might do a supplement of it. I'm sure I've got a couple questions. I'm just going to check. Okay, any questions? No. Okay, so it's 10.34. Why don't we take our 10 minute break until 10.45 and then come back? Does that sound good? We still have you guys? You guys already taking your break? I think you guys can still hear me. So good, we will see you guys shortly then, okay?
You want to say hi? Hi. Hi. You want to say hi, everybody? Yeah. Do it over your face. What do you think? Yeah. Say hi, everybody. Say hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. We gotta get you back up to mommy. Mama. Mama, yeah. We gotta start teaching. Today. Yeah. We're doing botanical medicine. Can you say botanical medicine? Hi. Yeah, close enough. Okay, say bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Okay, you guys here? I just thought I'd bring my daughter Alexia in to say hello. She's a sweetie. Uh, so how many people are in class? I'm curious. And how many people are at home? One of the advantages of doing it remotely is I can check on her on the break and not have to drive. So I'm going to turn uh, my camera off because I think, I mean, it's cute to see my daughter, but you don't need to see me and it'll make it run smoother, I think. So uh, let's just do this. Which one is it? That one. And thanks for responding people who are okay so how's the speed that I'm going at so far you guys the speed's okay I'm not talking too fast <clears throat> good okay okay so the next group of compounds we're going to talk about, probably my some of my favorites for sure, uh, are the flavonoids and stilbenoids. And oops, these two uh, groups of compounds, these are derived from the hydroxycinamic acid. And what basically happens in the plant is a go the plant goes and adds a bunch of other little groups onto it, little acetyl groups until it builds up the, uh, the branch on the side uh, until you get to a certain size. And then what will happen is that long uh, branch will cyclize and form uh, either the flavonoids or stilbenoids. So flavonoids are the classic. They've got three rings in there. Uh, these guys make up a very broad class of compounds of polyphenols. And then the stilbenoids, they're important, but they're not, uh, there's not as many different types of compounds in that. And so the classic stilbenoid is resveratrol, which you find in red wine. Actually, you find both in red wine, but we'll talk about that more in a second. So, stilbenoids. So, resveratrol is the classic stilbenoid. And so, unlike the flavonoids, there's only two ring structures. Now, they both, both flavonoids and the stilbenoids only have two phenol groups, uh, but, but the flavonoids have a third ring structure. I'll show you it to you in a second. So, resveratrol, because of the size of this and the two OH groups are set up at a certain distance, um, there's a few different interactions that can do. One, obviously, any of these phenol compounds are going to be antioxidants. 
Um, it has some anti-inflammatory effects as well, which I didn't really mention there, but just assume most of these guys probably will. Um, another thing that's interesting is a lot of these stilbenoids have phytoestrogenic properties. So red wine does have a little bit of phytoestrogenic effects. Um, it may help modulate certain hormones in the body. Uh, there is uh, one particular um, supplement that we have at the clinic here. When someone comes in with menopausal hot flashes, there's a few different things that I might try with them. And there's, I won't mention the company, but you can probably do your research to find it. There's one company that has exclusive rights to a particular uh, stilbenoid extract um, that it looks a lot like resveratrol, the compound, but it's slightly different. And it's used for menopausal hot flashes. Uh, and the company guarantees that money back guarantee if it doesn't work, refund your money. Uh, it doesn't work all the time. I've tried it on a few patients so far. And I think some people benefit, some people don't. But um, so these have the potential to have some of uh, some uh, and, um, uh, phytoestrogenic effects and help with menopausal hot flashes. Uh, also, these compounds may have some effects on mood. Uh, they may affect certain neurotransmitters. And the other interesting thing that a lot of uh, research has gone into is the potential anti-aging effect of resveratrol. Now, um, what's interesting about this is when you look at trying to enhance longevity, uh, most of us are basically going to die at 80, give or take two years. That's kind of statistically, something happens in our cells where uh, a little switch goes on around that time and we just die of natural causes around that period of time. Now, there are things you can do to uh, make yourself die earlier. So if you're smoking and, and drinking in excess and eating lots of sugar, you'll be lucky to make it 65. But for the average person, if you're healthy and you have a good diet, you're probably gonna die off around 80, give or take a few years. Now, if you're really healthy and eat lots of fruits and vegetables and you exercise, you can probably extend your lifespan a little bit more than that as well. Um, but to die of natural causes, that's sort of the number. Now, what's interesting is there's in theory, we thought, well, the aging process is due to oxidative stress. So like how our car rusts, if you give antioxidants, we should be able to extend maximum lifespan. And so they've done studies in the past where they take animals and they just supplement with antioxidants in hopes that this will slow down the aging process. But what they found is, although antioxidants can help reduce the risk of dying prematurely from heart disease or from from diabetes and things like that, they didn't actually extend maximum lifespan. And there's been a few things that they found um, that have, and one thing is, for example, caloric restricted diet uh, is one of the few things, approaches they found that can actually enhance or, or extend maximum lifespan. And so what they found in animals is that, let's say if a rat normally lives to three years, if you give it a near starvation diet, but give it all the various macro and micronutrients it needs, you can extend maximum lifespan um, from maybe three years to four years. You get an extra 25% because by starving the person, it seems, to, or the, the mouse or whatever it is, it seems to affect the genes and the switches uh, and can activate certain switches that can extend the lifespan, which is really fascinating. And so um, the problem is, is that this approach to extending the maximum lifespan isn't really that uh, desirable. Uh, most people don't aren't really that compliant doing it. Uh, in our culture, at least, most people are over-consuming, uh, drinking and eating far too much, and that's one of the problems. And so getting people to um, take a near starvation diet isn't really going to appeal to the general per person. So they're constantly trying to find other ways to do that. As I mentioned before, the adaptogenic herbs, they may help to extend maximum lifespan. They certainly, there's some research in animals that suggest that might be possible. Um, and another thing that's showing some promising research is resveratrol seems to activate the same sorts of genes uh, that are activated when people are taking these near starvation diets. The problem is, is that we don't know whether or not this is going to translate into 
benefits in humans if you actually do this. Uh, certainly, drinking you know the amount of resveratrol in a glass of wine um, is insufficient to do that. And the problem is drinking four bottles of wine. Uh, it might have enough resveratrol to extend lifespan, but the alcohol is going to certainly shorten your lifespan. And so, you know, this research is still. Um, I don't know if it's going to ever be possible to use resveratrol as a supplement to do that, but certainly there's a lot of research going into it. Um, I always get my my opinion on supplementation is when you start taking something uh, like resveratrol, for example, which is a naturally occurring substance that's safe in your diet, lots of beneficial effects, but if you take it at a dose that's like a hundred or a thousand times more than what you would get in your diet. Um, it's no longer acting uh, as a natural supplement. It starts having more of a drug-like effect. And that could be a good thing, but it also could have new side effects or concerns associated with it that you wouldn't get from just having one glass of wine every day. So um, so in general, resveratrol has got a lot of neat compounds. There's research that even shows um, drinking a glass of red wine um, has a lot of the same health benefits as going to the gym uh, for 20 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever it was. I remember seeing that study. Um, and so it activates certain genes and, and does has certain beneficial effects. Um, I think you should still go to the gym, but having a glass of wine periodically is not going to be a bad thing for anyone. Um, having a bottle or two a day will be a bad thing for anyone who does that. So it's all going to be dose dependent. Um, but I think the resveratrol or these other stilbenoids may be related. So in general, I don't, the verdict's still out on whether or not you should be supplementing with resveratrol. Um, I certainly think that consuming foods that contain the stilbenoids is going to be too good. So having, um, having drinking some coffee has certain antioxidants in it. Having a glass of wine will have other antioxidants in it. Um, the breakfast, which I don't know if I posted, I sent it to one person, um, has other antioxidants. Some of them will be a little bit of resveratrol. Grapes are particularly high in resveratrol, but you do get in other berries and also peanuts to some degree as well. Uh, uh, and there are certain herbs, interesting enough, in Chinese medicine, there's a herb called fo tea um, that's used to help to build up essence in the body and helps with longevity. And some of the main active ingredients in that I thought was interesting when I was looking at them are these stilbenoid-like compounds that are very similar to resveratrol. So um, I think there's lots of potential in these compounds. So uh, at this point, I just like eating a diet that contains some of them. I'm not doing any supplementation for myself yet. Except for that one stilbenoid product for menopausal hot flashes. I still haven't decided if it's worth it for the patients or not. Question asked, um, is the reduced caloric intake the same idea behind intermittent fasting? Uh, I don't know if that's, maybe, probably, um, they may have similar sort of effects. I think in general, um, doing a little bit of fasting is good. And I don't know if I mentioned you guys already, but I often tell my patients that when we're trying to do weight loss and doing health maintenance and health promotion, not only does it matter what you're eating and how much of the different certain sizes you eat. But what's also really important is when you're eating and eating, snacking a lot before bed is not a good idea. Um, it just interferes with your sleep and interferes with your detoxification process and all sorts of different things. And when our body goes through natural cycles where it wants to, um, basically you want to eat food, break it down and digest it, absorb it, do your various maintenance things. And then at night, I think you're going through sort of detoxification and elimination and other things uh, when you're sleeping. And so one study that I saw was interesting was I had two groups of cancer patients. One group uh, was basically fasting for 12 hours a day. So they'd eat dinner at, let's say, 7 o'clock and then not eat anything until 7 in the morning. And then the other group was eating in the evening. And what they found was the group that was doing the snacking in the evening um, that they actually weren't living as long as those that were fasting for 12 hours. And so 
even if you don't want to reduce your calories uh, to that near starvation state uh, or you don't want to do intermittent fasting, just don't snack in the evenings and you're going to get some of the health benefits. So don't overeat and give your body a break once in a while and, and just fast every single day for 12 hours and you're going to be doing a lot better. Um, and then I think for some people it might be beneficial to do some fasting one day a week or whatever it may be. Um, but there's certainly some benefits. If nothing else, it helps to uh, increase willpower and there's something spiritual about doing a little bit of fasting. Obviously, if you've got diabetes and other uh, hypoglycemia and stuff like that, you've got to be careful with that. But um, So, do you guys, can you hear me? Al says he's got no sound. I don't know if that's his end or my end. Sometimes I'm not sure. It usually tells me when it's an issue on my end. I just don't know if it's when it's an issue on your end. Just that one time, it, it actually gave me a message saying there was a dis you know, we were disconnected. So those are the stovenoids. So for the purpose of the exam, uh, I would say remember the take home is there's some anti aging effects. Also, I believe uh, I would I think another good thing is anti aging from a chemical structure standpoint. It's got two carbons between the three ring structure, unlike the flavonoids that has a three member bridge here, I'll show you. So, the flavonoids, so if you look, you've got, still only have two phenol groups here, but then in the center, this is not a phenol group. This is sort of a, this is just that three member bridge there, and it's got an oxygen, a part of that ring structure, and this is sort of unique. And the benefit of that oxygen, it's going to affect how the electrons flow. If they get absorbed here, they'll sort of move along the ring structure here, down along here. They can sort of move around and be sequestered in a whole bunch of different areas on this thing. And that's one of the benefits of the flavonoids is you've got two phenol groups and you've got these OH groups that can accept and donate and sequester these electrons. Plus there's a three-dimensional conformational effect that it has. It can interact with certain receptors to turn them on and off. Flavonoids are awesome. Uh, well, all the phytochemicals are awesome. So when you look at the flavonoids, and I say friends, because there are different ones that exist here. And, you know, the definition of which uh, for the flavonoids, the different subcategories of flavonoids are related to a few different structural things. First of all, if you remember, a ketone is a substance where you have a double bond to an oxygen. So let's look at the flavone here. This is a flavone. You've got a double bond attached to the O here. There's no OH groups on here. This is just the basic backbone for, for, the, for these flavones, okay? And so benzene ring, benzene ring, ketone group. That makes it a flavone. Now, an isoflavone means you still got that ketone group, but this second benzene ring here, instead of being attached at the two position, it's attached at the three position. That's opposite from, uh, from the attachment over here at the zero position. Okay? So iso Flavone refers to uh, where that second ring is. And by shifting it in three-dimensional di three space, although these compounds are identical, this could interact with certain receptors that this one cannot. And so one thing we know about the isoflavones uh, or the isoflavonoids, like those found in soy and licorice, is they act as phytoestrogens because of where this other ring structure is positioned. There are other ones called flavonols. So the first O refers to a ketone. So flavone tells me there's a ketone here, okay? So most things that have a ketone, that's significant. It'll end in O-N-E-S or O-N-E. Flavone, oops, all. The O-L refers to an alcohol. So the flavone is the ketone. The all, so flavonol, refers to the alcohol here in this, or OH group. 
And so this has both the ketone and the alcohol. You could also have a flavanol. So there's no ketone group. So technically speaking, it's not actually a flavonoid. It's a flavanol because there's no ketone group, but you've got the OH group here. And then finally, you've got these things called anthocyanidins, which are also not true flavonoids. Um, but you basically get these flavanols will form different sort of polymers uh, and they change and there's a positive charge on here. These guys will often stack up together and form various polymers. And so these are different compounds and you'll find these uh, in certain types of fruits and vegetables. In general, I would say that uh, berries will have more of one type, but they often will have all these simultaneously. It's just certain plants will have predominantly more flavanols than anthocyanidins, for example. And we'll, I'll give you some examples. So you don't need to memorize any of this stuff on this page. But these are different breakdowns of the different categories. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of different flavonoids that exist. There are usually a few different backbones. And the way that they change like the name of these compounds is dependent on where the OH groups are, uh, how many OH groups they have. That's the main thing. So blueberries, red wine, strawberries, apples, black tea, you can go through the list. You'll see some of these categories, things will appear in multiple categories. So for example, blueberries will have the anthocyanidins, that gives it the blue color. They'll have flavin three alls as well. Uh, and then you'll also see they'll have some flavanols in there and then some pro-anthocyanidins. Pro so you'll see multiple categories. And then you also have the blueberries, for example, they'll have some stilbenoids in there as well. So lots of great things found in blueberries. Blueberries is probably one of the top things. I think it's probably higher in antioxidants than coffee is. I don't know if they've ever done a comparison. It's probably even better for you than coffee is. The reality is most people don't eat blueberries every day. So I would encourage you to drink your coffee and have some blueberries because then you're getting lots of different classes of phytochemicals. And I think from a health standpoint, my opinion is the best way to be healthy, eat a plant-rich diet that's loaded in lots of diverse phytochemicals. That's how you get healthy. Taking a supplement of, you know, resveratrol, of like two grams a day, or taking 300 milligrams of quercetin every day or a 2,000 milligram or 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day. I, I don't think that does the same as taking lots of foods that are rich in these phytochemicals. So now with overall flavonoid intake, here's an example. This is 2015. If you look at you've got a thousand women um, consuming a diet that's rich in flavonoids, you're basically uh, reducing the risk of death by 12%. So the relative risk reduction in this group of women eating a diet that's rich in flavonoids is about a 63% relative risk reduction. And so absolute reduction, you're looking at about 7.6%. That's pretty significant. So what that means, one in 23 women in this particular group over the age of 75 who ate a diet that was rich in the flavonoids showed that reduction uh, so it's one in 23 women's lives would be saved by just eating more flavonoids in their diet. That's, that's really significant. Drugs don't do, well, a statin drug might do that, but uh, there's also going to be side effects. So 63% risk reduction is huge. You know, a lot of time you hear 5% or 10% risk reduction, 63 is big. So there's uh, an example of how significant eating flavonoids are. Um, here's a study, I think it was done in Japan, the benefits of drinking green tea. So people who drank five cups of green tea a day, uh, you can go through this and look at it. I don't know if you guys have studied relative risk reduction in, in, in your uh, research class yet, but basically you're talking about drinking tons of green tea every day will lower your risk of, what was this? I think it was a whole bunch of overall mortality, uh, by about 15%. So that's pretty good. Green tea is not like amazing, but 15% of relative risk reduction is good. So in this case, that means that for every, every person who's drinking more than five cups of green tea a day, 
one in 59 of those people won't have, won't die because of the green tea. So um, that's a lot of people who aren't getting benefit, but that at least one person does, that's good. So if you're able to, again, lots of different antioxidants, other than just trying to have one superfood, I think you want to have lots of different superfoods. Green tea is good. Mix it up with some coffee, have some berries, and away you go. Um, so we'll start off with the simplest one. These are the flavones. And so celery, I love celery. I'm a big fan of celery, and there's a few different phytochemicals in it. Why celery is great is a number of reasons. Um, it's not just crunchy water. First of all, when you eat a lot of celery, um, there's no calories in it. So you can eat as much of this as you want and you won't get fat. So that's good. So encouraging people to eat this, it fills them up a little bit more. Plus celery for a number of reasons. Um, it has blood pressure lowering effect, which is great. And I often include that in a diet when I'm trying to get people lower blood pressure. Uh, that's likely related to the apigen and the, and the uh, luteolin. These are flavones that we know have blood pressure lowering effects. We know that it lowers cholesterol as well. Um, the other thing with celery, which is good, is um, what else is good with celery? Doesn't no calories, lowers cholesterol. Oh, the apigenin and luteolin. It may have some antispasmodic effects to help with um, um, just cramping in the digestive tract. We also know that uh, these compounds um, are known to have an anti-inflammatory effect. They appear to reduce the risk of cancer. Apigenin is also found in chamomile tea, and it's likely to be the main ingredient in chamomile tea that has a nice calming effect. And so apigenin, um, it does interact with, with the benzodiazepine system. So the benzodiazepine system is what has a calming effect on the system. So drugs like Valium will interact with benzodiazepine receptors. And we know that apigen, they have a very slight calming effect on the body. They, they're partial agonists for these receptors and they have a calming effect. And so they can help with anxiety. Um, we also know that these phytochemicals have some anti-diabetic properties. They may also lower cholesterol. So, you know, celery, I think when I was younger, I was like, there's nothing really in it, it's just crunchy water. And now I realize how wrong I was um, when you think about in addition to the flavonoids, there's also other compounds called phthalides in it. Uh, there's probably some terpenoids in there as well. There's some essential oils in it. It does a lot of different things. Uh, so what makes it a flavone is the fact that it's got the ketone at the four position. So I don't know how much detail I'm going to go into on the exam. I might ask a difference is, you know, what's the difference between a flavone and an isoflavone or a... Um, anthocyanin. I might ask that. I don't go into a lot of the chemical structure, but there might be a few questions on that. Um, just to know what, you know, how to classify and what's the difference. So apigen and luteolin are great examples of that. Here's another thing. I just pulled it off of a research article I was looking at, and this shows you all the different areas where luteolin, that flavone, interacts where it could potentially have an anti-cancer effect. And so there are a few different mechanisms. It sequesters free radicals here. Uh, there's receptors that it's interacting with. Some of these I don't even understand, but it appears to induce apoptosis. Um, has some other mechanisms over here. So there's lots of different ways that these antioxidants are working. They're not, they're not just sequestering free radicals, but they're actually affecting certain receptors in the body and turning them on and off. So um, I would say, Anyone who wants an anti-cancer diet, I think what you need to do is just eat a diet rich in fruits and vegetables. And there's going to be certain fruits and vegetables that are going to be you know, higher in phytonutrients than other ones. The nice thing about celery, again, there's no calories in it, so you get a lot of the health benefits without a lot of the calories that can lead to heart disease and everything else. Uh, uh, someone, uh, Trina has asked me, have you ever come across Haskap berries? My parents are growing them on the East Coast. Uh, I don't know a lot about them. I've seen that they're, I just sort of noticed that people are starting to grow these. Um, they're probably really good for you. And they probably have a lot of the health benefits that blueberries and other berries have, but I don't have enough information specifically on them. 
Um, if you look at the phytochemicals in them, they're probably going to be overlapping with the with things like blueberries and stuff like that. So, um, so I don't know a lot about them. I've never tasted them. I'm curious to see what they're going to be like. I'm sure they're, they're good for you though. Um, a couple other flavones. Uh, on left, you've got oranges, where it has a lot of hesperitin in it. And then grapefruit has more of the narogenin. Okay, so those are two different flavones that you'll find in citrus. So, although I think berries are really good for you, I think it's good to have a variety. Have some oranges, have some grapefruit, have some celery, have some berries, and mix it up with your phytochemicals. And so, if you go and type in hesperitin in, in PubMed, you're going to see tons of different research articles. I don't know if they're better than the other flavonoids, but it's good to have a variety, in my opinion. So, I like having a, a mix. This morning I had. Uh, I had my breakfast with the oranges, mango, and flaxseed, hemp, chia, and all that. And then I also had in um, some pomegranate seeds. So I had a whole bunch of different phytochemicals um, this, this morning from different areas. So we had the elagic acid from the pomegranate, anthocyanidins from the pomegranates. We had some of the flavones from here. We had some lignans from the flax, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um... Uh, so the next ones we'll talk about are the flavanols. <clears throat> so flavanols, quercetin is probably the most prevalent supplement uh, when it comes to the flavonoids. Uh, although there are lots of different ones, quercetin is the one big one that I, I do use this as a supplement for people for certain conditions. The main thing that I use quercetin for is for allergies. So uh, people with seasonal allergies all often say take vitamin C and quercetin. It's benign. It works pretty good. I mean, it's not as it's not a potent drug. Usually, if some symptoms are like a six out of ten, you might get them down to anywhere between a two and a four out of ten. So you know, maybe fifty percent reduction or twenty-five to sixty percent reduction is sort of what I might see in practice. And I explain to people that it's you know it's not perfect, but it works pretty good. And they want to do that, they can do that. I also might do. Um, Combine that with a tincture or some teas for allergies as well, using some rosemary and some other things, uh, and it works well. So, but in general, the quercetin is one of these flavanols. So, what's different with this is you've got the ketone group and you've got the alcohol group on that center ring there, and that's what makes it a flavanol. So, an exam question I might say, um, you know, a flavanol has a a ketone at the four position and an alcohol at the three position, or B, no ketone, uh, only the alcohol, three, you know, I might ask something like that. There won't be a lot of questions on that, but, you know, I might ask a, a handful of questions on that sort of stuff. Um, so quercetin is your, your classic one. Uh, it's an antioxidant, like every single one of these polyphenols. Anti-inflammatory, like all the polyphenols. Anti-cancer, like all of these ones, uh, all the uh, phenol compounds. And then I think with it, an antihistamine is sort of unique with it. Um, when you look at the onion on the left-hand side, it's a great source of quercetin. And uh, certainly there will be quite a bit just by consuming a diet that has a lot of onions in it. Also, citrus uh, will have quercetin in addition to the other flavones that it has. Uh, leafy vegetables. When you're drinking green tea, a lot of people um, talk about tea and how healthy and health promoting it is in addition to containing some specific flavonoids we'll talk about in a second it does contain things like quercetin as well so most foods don't have just one thing they have multiple phytochemicals in it um, if you look at the color of the onion you can see uh, I'll be honest I cheated a little bit and enhanced it in Photoshop just a bit to pull out the yellow so you can see them better but there are those yellow compounds in the onion um, are the are the compounds like quercetin? So in Latin, flavus means yellow. And so flavonoids, uh, most of the original flavonoids are because a lot of things like quercetin are yellow in color. Uh, some of the other flavonoids have different colors. And just like when we we're talking about the terpenoids, remember how we were talking about the tetraterpenoids, or rather the carotenoids that were orange and red in color? It's all to do with how many conjugated double bonds you have. So how many double bonds? that are basically connected side by side. So 
naturally when you have a phenolic ring, you have double bond, space, double bond, space, and then you have space, double bond, space, double bond, space, double bond. You can see this is what's affecting the wavelength, the light that they basically reflect and absorb. And so with the flavanols, um, these are going to be uh, reflecting this nice yellow color. And so that's what gives it its pigment. Okay. Um, if you break that up, let's say you add hydrogen peroxide and you bleach it and you destroy that double bond, these double bonds here, then it'll lose its color because you're disrupting those conjugated bonds. It's just for interest. So quercetin, I do use it as a supplement. It's probably one of the few flavonoid supplements on the market. Now, another thing I want to emphasize is that although there might be hundreds of different flavonoids that exist, there can also be um, different glycosides of those flavonoids. And so there could be literally thousands, an infinite number of flavonoid gly glycosides that exist. And quercetin is usually one of the main backbones for other glycosides. Um, so for example, here you've got quercetin, the pink molecule there, that's your flavanol, so you can see it. And rutin is a glycoside. So just a couple sugar molecules are added on to this OH group here. And then through hydrolysis, the quercetin molecule gets liberated. Uh, and this will occur to some degree in your digestive tract. Also, certain gut bacteria will make things like rutin uh, more biologically active by removing the sugars. And I remember looking at one study with ulcerative colitis where they found that quercetin was relatively in, ineffective for uh, treating um, ulcerative colitis, but rutin as a supplement was beneficial. I've never seen anyone sell rutin as a supplement, but what I suspect was maybe happening is maybe the quercetin was being altered structurally in the stomach or in the small intestine and never really made it to, uh, to the large intestine in, in this sort of form. But with rutin, maybe it was a way to sort of basically allow the rutin to get to the large intestine for the bacteria there to now digest the sugars off and liberate it. So quercetin was more biologically active uh, in the bowels. So not unlike when we talked about the glycosides like arbutin, that it became active once it reached the urinary tract and the sugar was removed by the E. coli there. So the probiotics, the good bacteria, will also remove these sugars and have a positive effect, uh, making it more biologically active. Uh, um, I don't actually remember what I wrote in here. This is just talking about the different varieties of onions and the phenolic compounds in there and the health benefits and, and anti-cancer effects of it. Um, I must have found this interesting at some point, but you don't need to know these things. I just pop them in there occasionally just for, for interest sake. So the next group of compounds we'll talk about are the isoflavones. So the isoflavones are essentially identical to the flavones from a chemical structure standpoint, where they differ is their orientation in three-dimensional space. And so the two classic isoflavones you should know about are genistine and um, didazine. These two compounds are the classic phytoestrogens that you get in soy. And they can also exist as a glycoside with sugars attached and everything else. In, addi in addition to soy, soy is in the legume family. And so you find other legume herbs like red clover and licorice also contain isoflavones. And they may, some of them will contain both these compounds. Other herbs will have their own compounds. And so when you're consuming a diet that's rich in legumes, most legumes will have some phytoestrogens in there. And so in my opinion, phytoestrogens aren't something that people should be as scared of. I do think that excess of amounts of certain phytoestrogens um, could potentially be problematic. But if you're eating a plant-rich diet, I'm not really concerned about that. I think the average person would benefit from having more phytoestrogens in their diet. Uh, if you're having, you know, if you had estrogen-positive breast cancer and a few other things, 
maybe you want to be careful. Um, but from just normal dietary isoflavonoids, I'm not overly concerned. Um, and like I said, the main difference between, from a structural standpoint, between the isoflavones and the normal flavones is just the position of the ring. So instead of being positioned at the two position, it's at the three position. And that's the only difference. Um, this is a type of um, isoflavane. So it's not actually an isoflavonoid, but isoflavane. This is found in licorice uh, and it's called glabridin. And this is one of the compounds that has phytoestrogenic properties in licorice. So when you look at Chinese medicine, a lot of the Chinese formulas have licorice in it. But in particular, there are certain formulas like peony and licorice that are used for conditions like menstrual complaints, PCOS, endometriosis. And so licorice has so many different phytochemicals that are having effects. And this is just one other one that might be responsible for some of the therapeutic effects in, addi in addition to the glycerides and some of the other compounds. So now we're going to talk about the flavanols. I would say these are not really true flavanones, like flavanoids, because there's no ketone group on these guys. Um, they have the alcohol, but no ketone. And they're going to be structurally a little bit different uh, and have some therapeutic effects that will be unique to them as well. So the flavanols, these are also going to be uh, building blocks for certain compounds like catechin and uh, epigallocatechin, um, some compounds you find in green tea, but they also end up becoming the building blocks for making things like the various cyanidins, like the anthocyanidins and also the, the uh, proanthocyanidins and the legal merit proanthocyanidins. So flavin 3 alls these are basically compounds that, uh, as I mentioned, they have the OH group still at the 3 position, but they don't have um, the ketone group in it. And these guys, they have slightly different effects. They're going to have, uh, for the plant, they absorb UV radiation. And so one of the reasons why I suspect that plants make it is that it's a natural sunscreen for tea. And tea tends to grow at high altitudes where there's going to be more UV radiation. So I would imagine the compounds like catechin and epicatechin are designed to act as a sunblock for the plants. These catechins are also found not just in tea, but also in chocolate. And so chocolate has a number of different catechins in it as well. And the health benefits of chocolate is significant. Um, there is one study I saw where just men eating chocolate bars, even, you know, if it's real chocolate, but even, you know, chocolate, milk chocolate that has sugar and, and dairy in it, there's health benefits to that. Um, it's, it's a healthy thing to do. I don't think the sugar and the milk is the best thing for people, uh, but chocolate is absolutely good for you. You want to reduce the amount of sugar and reduce the amount of uh, dairy in it. But chocolate's like red wine. You know, the, the phytochemicals are good for you. It's just you don't want too much of the sugar or alcohol, right? So green tea has lots of health benefits. And as I mentioned, people consuming more green tea and, and black tea. Uh, black tea is slightly different. There's other phytochemicals in it through the fermentation process, but they're both really good uh, for you. Um, someone was just asking, uh, is dark chocolate the best one to eat? At least 70% dark chocolate? Um, one thing that I do is I eat 90% dark chocolate and it it's bitter, but I, my taste buds like bitter. I drink my coffee black. I love, I love bitter chocolate. I love 90%. And it's funny, originally, uh, I was eating 70% and then my wife was like, oh, there's so much sugar in that. You shouldn't be eating that. And I kind of complained and then she bought me 90%. And you know what? I didn't like the 90% at first. I thought it was way too bitter. Um, if you go higher than 90%, I find it gets kind of dry and crumbly. But the 90%, I, she didn't buy me other stuff, so I ate it. And you know what? After about a week of eating the 90%, I started really liking it. And switching back to the 70, I found the 70, my taste buds completely changed. I found the 70% to be way too sweet. And so I would say 90% is certainly going to be the best because you're lowering your sugar. Sugar is going to be you know, bad for you in a dose-dependent fashion. 
I suspect low amounts of sugar. And I think removing all sugar from the diet, if I want to be a little fanatical, is probably really good for you. I think reducing for the average person, you know, greatly reducing your sugar intake, certainly getting rid of like high fructose corn syrup and everything else is uh, soft drinks and all that. It's good. The sugar and fruit, a little bit's probably not going to hurt you, I don't think. And a little bit of chocolate's not going to be a big deal. I think someone's better off eating 70% chocolate than no chocolate. I think someone's, you know, uh, for my daughter, um, her taste buds doesn't, she doesn't really know a lot of sugar. And so uh, she, eats, she eats Baker's chocolate because she doesn't realize that you know, <laughs> 70% or, uh, or less chocolate exists. So she loves chocolate. She'll eat the Baker's chocolate. Um, Sometimes I'll uh, add a little bit of, uh, like for her breakfast, I usually make uh, the nut and seed balls for her with the, uh, the hemp and the almond butter. Uh, add a little cocoa powder to it, uh, hemp, almond, and I mix in the chia. And sometimes I'll add a little bit of honey just to sweeten it up for a bit because the honey does have phytochemicals and it has a lot of the flavonoids that we're talking about that the bees collect when they're gathering from the plants. Um, but the thing with sugar is the more you give kids, the more they want it. And if they're not used to sugar, they're not going to eat it. And adults in the same way, when you're consuming a lot of sugar in your diet, it distorts your taste buds. It's like warps your perspective. And so when you remove the sugar, you go through a little bit of withdrawal, but eventually you start detecting sugar at smaller concentrations because you become sensitized to it again. Um, so even with our daughter, because we never gave her sugar and she would drink, I, I kid you not, one of her favorite drinks is a, is a decaf espresso and I make them for her sometimes. Um, and most days she wants to have a sip of my coffee or, or my wife's tea and she loves all of it. She's got a weird palate, um, but that we've never given her sugar. And for her birthday, when we gave her a birthday cake, she ate the strawberries off the cake, but she refused. She just pushed away the cake because it was too sweet and she didn't like it. So um, so going back to chocolate, 90% is probably the best. Um, but, you know, whatever is going to get it in them. Um, what I do for hot chocolate is we'll get the coconut milk. I'll add in the coke, like pure cocoa powder to it. Then I'll add just a little bit of uh, honey to it to sweeten it and then blend it up in the blender when it's uh, after it's been warmed up. And I think it tastes great. Um, yes, it's not as sweet as, as the stuff you buy from the grocery store, but um, if this is what you're used to, it's great. Um, with regards to, I was thinking, one of the things with Halloween candy now is, I don't think they use a lot of chocolate in, that, in the chocolate bars anymore, some of them. I had a peanut butter cup the other day, uh, just because it's one of, those, one of my favorite ones from a kid, and I had it, and it was awful. It didn't even taste like chocolate. Um, it was overly sweet and so I don't know if the chocolate's changed or if I've changed but um, it's definitely not as good for you as some of that stuff so I, I question whether or not a lot of the candy on the market is even made with real chocolate anymore because chocolate's quite expensive so obviously the 70 or 80 percent it probably is but uh, some of the other candy bars and stuff I don't know if they are because they don't call them chocolate bars right the candy bars so um, so here's a study what was this uh, uh, this is just a study that's talking about the health benefits of tea. Both green and black tea have health benefits, and they lower the risk of a number of causes of death. Um, you ever wonder what chocolate looks like? That's a picture of a I took of a cocoa bean. I think it's quite pretty. You eat this; those little white things on the inside is where the cacao pods are. Um, so. That's chocolate there. Now, um, the compounds that we're talking about earlier, the catechins, these are the, um, the, the flavanols. Um, in green tea in particular, although you do probably get a little bit in some of the other, like black tea, one of the active ingredients in it is something called EGCG, and this has some very, very interesting uh, therapeutic effects. That's different some of the, from some of the other flavonoids that we've talked about. Um, the EGCG stands is basically uh, what it contains is epigallocatechin and a gallate molecule. So gallic acid is a simple phenolic compound, simple phenolic acid compound um, that's used to make tannins. Uh, 
Uh, it's a very stringent compound, and that's basically attached to the this flavanol molecule up there. And so this particular compound may be some of the unique health properties associated with green tea. You don't get as much in black tea, I don't think. You don't find this in chocolate. So although chocolate will have the various catechins, it doesn't contain the EGCG. So this is unique to uh, to to green tea. Um, it's been shown to have some antioxidant effects. It may benefit chronic fatigue syndrome. It may help with endometriosis. It may have some benefits for HIV. So um, I think that's interesting. One thing I didn't talk about is that green tea, in addition to having the caffeine, there's a phytochemical called theanine. It's a type of amino acid derivative. And the theanine uh, is often referred to as a Zen compound. And so when you drink green tea, although there's caffeine in it that acts as a stimulant, the green tea has the uh, theanine in it that has a calming effect on the nervous system. And so uh, theanine helps with concentration. So you've got caffeine as a stimulant, theanine is a bit of a sedative, so you kind of have a more calm stimulatory effect. Um, I find I can drink a lot more green tea before I get buzzy and jittery. And I find I get a bit of a focus, better focus drinking green tea. If I get drink too much coffee, I definitely get jittery and I need to run around and burn off the caffeine. Um, but that benefit of the green tea is unrelated to what we're talking about here. So that's EGCG. Type that into PubMed. I do gallocatechin gallate. There's tons of research studies on this guy. Uh, so the funny thing with cancer, is, here's a study where it says, a systematic review, 2015, I always thought it was really good for cancer, but green tea consumption was significantly inversely associated with heart disease and all cause of mortality, whereas black tea consumption was significantly inversely associated with all cancers and all cause of mortality. So uh, I don't think the green tea, uh, what was it? I thought there was one study that showed it may not have as much of an effect on cancer. I was reading. That's why I put a question mark on it. Anyway, so go on. Where was it? Maybe it's here. Oh, here it was. That's where the study was. So this one, this systematic review shows that it helped prevent heart disease and a number of other things, but there is no association was found between green tea consumption and total cancer mortality, so death from cancer. So although it has cancer, some anti-cancer effects, it doesn't seem to decrease the death from cancer necessarily. So uh I thought that was interesting. Uh, okay. The final group of compounds we're going to talk about in the flavonoids are the anthocyanidins. And again, these aren't true flavonoids. These are related to the flavanols. Now, if you look, think about green tea. What color is it? It's not blue or red. You know, it's green, right? Um, there's going to have, the green tea is going to have some quercetin in it. It's going to give it a bit of a yellow color. But these flavanols, they don't really have, I don't think they have much color because there's no conjugated double bonds here. So this will absorb the UV radiation, but it's not going to have, the, the flavanols themselves don't have a pigment. So it's going to be more from the course than some of the other compounds. Now, anthocyanidins, these compounds are rich in berries and fruits that are red and blue and purple in color. Okay. So the way that the double bonds are all conjugated here, they will reflect those colors, in particular, the red, blue, uh, and purple. And so anthocyanidins, these are not true flavonoids. They're a subclass of flavanols. They don't have the ketone group, but they do have a double, couple double bonds on that central ring. And that's going to go and affect their ability to absorb and donate electrons, but also to absorb UV light. Many of them will exist as a cation, where there's basically a positive charge on the oxygen group in the center ring. And I think that allows it to easily form polymers. Now, a couple of names. I want you to remember this. Anthocyanins are basically glycosides of the anthocyanidins. So when you attach a sugar onto an anthocyanidin, you get the anthocyanins. And one of the things, if you look at things like grape juice and blueberry juice, it's blue, right? Wine is blue. Um, or purple or whatever color it is. And that's because in addition 
a lot of things like cyanidins, there's a lot of OH groups on here, so they will be somewhat soluble in water. And then if you stick sugars on them, they're going to be really soluble in water. And so that's one of the reasons why certain fruit juices, um, you know, are, are, um, are colored the way they are. So in general, the anthocyanins and anthocyanidins, the, they will be found in lots of different flowers and berries. And so blueberries and grapes and cranberries, elderberries, cabbages, cherries, these guys are all rich in these compounds. And I think these are really important for lots of different reasons. Obviously, they're antioxidants. You know, you're going to have some anti-inflammatory effects, I'm sure. Um, going to have some anti-cancer effects. And some of these guys will also have some anti-adherence effects. I think some of the other flavonoids might as well. We'll talk about that in a second. But um, elderberry, when you look pound, like when you look at the concentration, I was just reading a study that talked about dietary antioxidants. And coffee was like number five, I think. Uh, for like maybe number seven for like some of the richest antioxidant uh, capacity for serving size and elderberries I think was number one and not a lot of people barely anyone eats elderberry so that's why it's not like the number one dietary antioxidant because you know very few people eat it eat it but elderberry it pounds a lot it packs a lot of punch for those little berries or that nice rich purple color are going to be the anthocyanidins when you look at things like cabbage Red cabbage, um, in addition to having all having those benefits that you get from having a brassica, so we'll talk about a little bit later on, is some of those sulfur compounds that, and some other compounds that are found in, in broccoli and cabbage and kale. Red cabbage in particular, it's been bred to have anthocyanidins in it as well. And so why not, if you're going to eat cabbage, have the red cabbage so that you're getting multiple phytochemicals in it you're getting more uh, bang for your buck than you would from normal cabbage. Um, one of the things that I do all the time is, um, not all the time, but at certain times of the year, is we often will make uh, various tacos using come up wraps or making quesadillas with come up wraps. And we'll take red cabbage and we'll shred it, add a couple limes to it, add some fresh coriander, uh, add some salt, and you basically have a really nice, fresh, tangy coleslaw. And you've got the red cabbage that has lots of phytochemicals that are health promoting. You've got the coriander that's going to have lots of different phytochemicals and essential oils. And the lime is going to have various uh, flavonoids in it that are good for you. Uh, and it tastes really good uh, with fish tacos or chicken tacos and stuff like that. And so, um, you know, there's so many different ways you can sneak healthy vegetables into a diet. And then if you have a, if you had a taco that had deep fried uh, fish in it or uh, chicken with lots of cheese on it you know it's not so bad when you have those foods in the presence of all these phytochemicals and I think one of the problems when people are eating fast food it's not so much that you're eating you know bad you're eating the I mean it is partly that you're consuming more sugar and kind of poor quality protein and lots of starch but it's also the void of phytochemicals that you get when you eat fast food and so uh, you know if you if you just have tacos with cheese and ground beef and, and wheat, uh, there's no phytochemicals in that. You start throwing in the spices, you throw in the fresh coriander, the chili powders, uh, the red peppers, the onions, uh, and then you have some red cabbage coleslaw with it as well. Uh, you've just made it being like an unhealthy meal to being you know packed with antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. And like I said, this is what I do for a living is train people how to eat healthy and give them ideas. Uh, and not to mention, it all tastes better too. In my opinion, um, question. Uh, just notice it now. I'm gonna get to that. Two questions came up, and I'll get to it after I'm done. You may have also heard, or you may hear about uh, compounds called illegal merit proanthocyanidins. They're also uh, shortened down the OPCs. What these compounds are is you get polymers of the various catechins that we're talking about earlier on, and they'll stack in together to form these guys. And so these are also going to be found in uh, various berries. Um, these are often referred to as non-hydrolyzable tannins. Um, they have health benefits. We'll talk about them more later on. 
but these are also just other versions of the anthocyanidins. Now, something that's kind of cool about anthocyanidins is they will change color based on the environment, the acidity of the environment that they're in. So when you look at cranberries or blueberries, one is red, one is blue, but they're very similar from a phytochemical standpoint. Cranberries are much more acidic than blueberries are. And so the change in color is more associated with the pH because the pH changes the conjugation of those double bonds because there's a positive ion, that, that cation that you see on the uh, anthocyanidins is going to uh, affect their ability to absorb and donate protons and it's going to affect the double bonds and everything else. So what's neat is if you have, if you want to do a little fun little experiment with kids, um, make a cup of hibiscus tea or uh, some grape juice or blueberry juice. Um, if it's already, if it's nice and blue in color and you add, let's say, lemon juice to it, it'll shift the color from being blue, blue to being more purple or red in color. So it's just a fun little experiment that you can do. Um, and if you alkalize it, uh, make it more basic, um, it'll change it from, like if you took, uh, let's say, cranberries and, and added baking soda to it, it should make it more blue or possibly even green in color. So um, when you're looking at uh, like the litmus paper used to measure the pH of solutions, some of those could be using things like anthocyanin, which is kind of fun. So this little, I didn't do this myself, but I think this picture here, they're using purple cabbage or red cabbage to do this little experiment. Um, and I just took, instead of doing it at home, I just did it with, took the Wikipedia photo because I was lazy. Um, but uh, certainly uh, I was at uh, one of the tea stores that you go, if you see it at the mall, and they had a new Halloween uh, tea out called Magic Potion. And uh, what they did is, they, I think it was probably with a red hibiscus or, or sorry, some kind of berry-like substance, maybe it was elderberry or something. And when they added lemon juice to it, it changed it from being blue to the red. And I was like, oh, well, that's the anthocyanidin changing colors. And the person didn't know what I was talking about. But anyways, um, so that's uh, another interesting quality that you get with the anthocyanidins. Quercetin or other flavonoids and flavones, they don't do this. So this is kind of unique for the anthocyanidins. Another place, another example of these anthocyanidins is, for example, blood oranges. So oranges in general don't really have a lot of the anthocyanidins in it, but the blood oranges, the red color that's in that, that's because they've been bred to express the, the, the other compounds. So you get a little added benefit if you had blood oranges. It's kind of like having oranges and berries in one. Um, the health benefits of apples is related to lots of different things. There are various terpenoids in there. Uh, there's some triterpenoids in there that are good for you. Uh, there's fiber that's good for you. And also uh, the deep red apples, like red and delicious, which in my opinion aren't really that delicious. It's my least favorite apple. But regardless, red and delicious is probably the healthiest apple you can eat because it's the richest in these anthocyanidins. It's that red pigment there is very similar to the colors that you get in berries. So if you don't like eating blueberries, have an apple. I really do think an apple a day is good for you as long as it's not covered in pesticides uh, and it's not green. And I'm sure green apples are okay for you to some degree, but. So again, the anthocyanins, you got ones like cyanidin and delphinidin. These are also rich in wine. So when you're drinking a glass of red wine, Part of the benefits are related to uh, the stilbenoids like resveratrol and also the health benefits are going to be related to the anthocyanidins. Uh, I might ask a question on exam like uh, which of the following phytochemicals are most abundant in red wine and I might say A, uh, anthocyanidins and uh, let's say mucilage or B, anthocyanidins and stilbenoids or C, uh, you know, flavanols and uh, isoflavonoids, uh, something like that. Um, just just try to remember the main classes. I like talking about foods because it's good to relate and stuff. Uh, okay, I got a qu couple questions here. Uh, one question was, what are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners like Splenda? 
um, that pass through your GI tract and are not absorbed. There are a number of different artificial sweeteners. Some of these artificial sweeteners are alcohol sugars. Um, some of them do other things. Stevia um, is a natural artificial sugar. Um, my opinion on it is I think when you take an artificial sweetener, although you're not consuming glucose or fructose that can mess up your blood sugar directly, they still mess around with your hormones to some degree. So it's better for someone who's diabetic probably to have one of those types of artificial sweeteners, but it's better yet. I mean, what they should be doing is just consuming less sugar and artificial sweeteners in general. I think some of those artificial sweeteners are really, really bad for you and I don't trust them. And I think that more and more research is coming out showing that sometimes they still mess up with insulin because your body can't tell the difference. And so you're still potentially messing with some of the insulin levels and making them more um, uh, insulin resistant. Um, so I'm not a big fan. I do tell people in practice, if I'm trying to wean them off sugar, I might tell them they can use stevia leaf as a, as a sweetener. Um, and I, you know, at Christmas time, the advantage of using something like stevia over sugar is at least you're not feeding, let's say, yeast in your gut or other bugs in your gut uh, and getting that whole fermentation process going on. Or if they're getting a lot of gas uh, and bloating, it could be from the sugar in their diet. So I don't like them. So in an ideal world, I'd say don't use artificial sweeteners. But from a harm reduction approach, sometimes you have to. So... Adrian asked a question, do you ever worry about the origin of your green tea from somewhere with pollution or adulterants? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I, don't, I think in general, anything that comes, I don't trust anything that comes from China. I know that's not really, you know, I don't usually use that kind of strong language, but uh, I, I just don't trust stuff in China. I know there's probably going to be some good products from China, but um, there seems to be an awful lot of uh, questionable business practices going on in China. So unless I had some personal experience and, and really, you know, someone could really guarantee me that things are safe, I'd rather go with, for example, green tea. Japan's got the best green tea, hands down. You'll pay five times as much in some cases, but it's, it's a much better green tea. Uh, oops. Sorry. One last thing that I want to say. Uh, and then we'll end it there for the day is that some of these uh, anthocyanins that you'll find in, for example, uh, elderberries and cranberries, some of these will act as anti adherence agents. And so with bacteria and viruses, in order for them to infect the cells, they have to, first of all, grab a hold and then uh, kind of stick onto the cells before they can invade it. And so in the urinary tract, in the respiratory tract, you've got the mucous membranes and so this little drawing I made up here is like a little octopus. So those little suction cups have to grab a hold of the mucosa and then it'll infect it. So certain things, including certain sugars, but also anthocyanins, will bind to these as adhesion molecules here uh, and block them so that it makes it trickier for bacteria and certain viruses to uh, infect cells. So we know that cranberry juice uh, can lower the risk of getting certain types of urinary tract infection. Elderberry juice or flowers can reduce the risk of getting influenza and the common cold because it has this antiviral uh, property associated with these anthocyanins. Um, so we're pretty much done. Uh, someone asked a question. Uh, Maddie said, are these compounds heat sensitive? If you're cooking foods containing them, do they degrade? Uh, every chemical is uh, heat sensitive. Um, don't forget, if you're boiling something in water, it won't exceed 100 degrees Celsius. Uh, they're relatively stable, but again, if you're barbecuing them at like 500 degrees Celsius, you probably break them down. But if you're boiling it in tea or making them in uh, a soup or a curry or something like that, most of these guys are pretty stable at that temperature. Uh, Exposure to heat long-term will denature any chemicals. I think these are pretty stable, though. Uh, now, Kieran says, is honey a better option to use instead of sugar? I would say absolutely it's a better. Uh, both honey and maple syrup are, would be much better to use than pure sugar. And the reason for that is that honey contains phytochemicals, lots of different 
flavonoids uh, are found in honey. That nice yellow and orange color that you see in honey is due to the flavonoids that the bees collect from the flowers and put into the uh, and uh, put into the, and the nectar gets turned into honey with all those compounds. Honey is amazing. It's really healthy for you, but again, it's dose dependent. A little bit of honey actually has some anti-diabetic effects because of the uh, various flavonoids in there. But appreciate that excess amounts of honey is going to have too much sugar. So it's like red wine. One or two servings might be good for you. Ten servings is going to make everything worse. So um, so when I make my daughter's hot chocolate, I'll add a little bit of honey to the coconut milk and the cocoa powder to sweeten it and taste great. And she's still getting the health benefits. So to me, honey is like, it's like a serving of fruit. But too much fruit is also not good for you uh, because of the sugar. Uh, will we be covering the end of this lecture in future in a future lecture? Will we be covering the end of this lecture in a future lecture? Uh, we will be doing. I think we did cover the end of this lecture, but we'll do be doing starting here next week. We'll be doing the polyphenols and talking about the tannins, and so this is kind of related. Oh, I see what you mean. I printed up the handouts for the phenolic compounds, and that's going to cover a couple lectures. Uh, so this lecture and probably part of the next lecture. So yes, we will be finishing this for sure. Sorry, Kim, I didn't understand there. Uh, any more questions before we go? And so next week we will be doing um, uh, continuing this and probably getting into the... What else are we doing? Let me just have a look here. We'll be covering these guys and then finishing probably the phenols. We might start the alkaloids as well, but there's no rush to do that. Because uh, we got lots of time from now to the end of the year. Okay? All right. Well, I hope you guys have a great day. And if you have any questions, let me know. Okay?